The Man Whore Podcast is sponsored by HotMovies.com. Man Whore Podcast fans can enjoy 40 free minutes of sexy, ethical porn viewing by signing up at ManWhorePod.com slash HotMovies. Now let's get to the show. Welcome to the Man Whore Podcast. Shout out to the Casual Cucks, Horny Housewives, and Bashful Ball Busters. This is Billy Presida, and you're listening to the Man Whore Podcast. All right, all right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the show. If you are new, uh, this is a podcast where I typically talk to women I've hooked up with about sex, dating, and why we didn't work out. However, uh, this week's guest is not one of my former flames. No, no, no. This week, we have got on a fantastic woman, Emily Linden, is finally on the podcast, and I'm just so excited to share her with y'all in a bit, because this is actually an episode that has been years in the making. We've just been uh, waiting to share a zip code, pretty much. Uh, But first, I want to tell y'all about my Friday night, because it was sick. Uh, Friday night, I attended an underwear party at the Museum of Sex. Uh, it was hosted by Hacienda. It wasn't a sex party. Uh, it was actually called Second Base, so all the sexy times had to remain above the belt. But it was pretty much just like a really fun dance party in underwear where we also could um, see one of the exhibits uh, at the museum. And there was also some like some kink scenes going on upstairs, all all in good fun, right? And I've been chatting with this just like this gorgeous gal from Philly, and we decided to go to this together for our first encounter. So I'm already nervous about being, you know, trying to make sure like I'm attractive in person to her. No- nothing hurts more than when you find you talk to someone for forever, and then you finally meet up in person, and you're like, "Ooh, you're good at taking photos." But now I'm also like nervous if our chemistry is going to work like within a big sexy party. Uh, not to mention just the usual anxiety I get at at events like this because uh, you know for those of y'all who remember what happened in December, I I attend shit and I don't know if some random person's gonna come up to me and just yell at me. I'm at that point where I'm like I'm prepared for it kind of at all times in certain spaces. But we go. Uh, we also went with Sarah from uh, episode two hundred eight. Shout out to Sarah and we all kind of we went to the party and hung out and it was it was a good time. Um, we danced, we drank, we laughed, we got glitter, uh, painted on us and, and the glitter is still on me as of this recording, which is, you know, fun, but also frustrating. It was just like a fantastic time. And, you know, at one point I did notice that my most recent ex was there. Now, this is not the ex I was expecting to be at the party. I was expecting P to be there because P is, you know, a little bit more entrenched in the Hacienda scene. But I got nervous because I don't know. I didn't know how they would react to seeing me there. They weren't at the pool party, which is where I was nervous about seeing them. And, you know, I definitely was having a little bit of a freak out. And it was, you know... if I hadn't gone with these two wonderful women, I I think I wouldn't have had a good time. There was a, just a lot of anxiety. It, for me, it wasn't about seeing them with with the part, you know, with the people that they went with and clearly they're having a good time and you know, they're having fun and have their pasties on and like good for them, mazel. But just like, I don't know, there was an anxiety of just like being in their presence. Which sucked because, like, part of me had to be like, this is my space. Like, I've been with this crew for way longer. I introduced them to these parties. So, why am I nervous? I shouldn't be nervous. And then, uh, and you know, and then I just focused on having a good time. So, there was this the, the reason I'm bringing this up is not to be like, oh my God, I saw my ex and I freaked out. Ah. It was, it's to share this funny story of <laughs> there was a wheel. One of the little things that Hacienda sometimes has is they have a little wheel just to get people 
talking to each other and socializing and, and getting into some sexiness. So it's like a sexiness wheel, has fun things like kiss a stranger, get spanked, spank someone. Um, and so we're all, so me and, and these two women are, Sarah and, and, and my date are spinning the wheel. These two other women come and join us. And they're joining us with spinning the wheel. And this one very cute blonde named Courtney spun the wheel. And it landed on share a secret. And she waves me over and leans in to my ear and shares her secret with me. And her secret was, I might be the biggest fan of your podcast. Now, I I did I I think we barely introduced each other. I think we exchanged names that say I didn't be like, hey, I'm Billy, I'm this man whore boy. Or I wasn't like, uh, we weren't like, oh, what do you do? Oh, I do a podcast. No, no, no. She just recognized me. Or maybe she recognized my pin. I was I was wearing my stay slutty button. And she said, I might be the biggest fan of your podcast. And I was like, this is the best secret anyone's ever told me. Best secret ever. <laughs> And so, yeah, um, that was great. My ex was behind us, actually, for this entire thing. And and Courtney turns around and, I guess, bumps into them or they grab Courtney. I don't entirely remember how it came to pass. It kind of all happened really quickly. But next thing I know, I see Courtney making out with my ex. And I'm like, cool, whatever. I start just laughing. This is the moment of the night where just like my disposition really turned to like, oh, you know what? I'm having a good time. This woman who's a fan of the show makes out with my ex, doesn't know that, you know, they didn't, I don't think they knew each other, then turns back to me and then I pulled her over and I was like, I think you just made out with my ex. And this girl was like, oh no, I'm, I'm, oh oh my God, I suck. I feel like such a disloyal fan. (laughs) She felt this loyal. I loved it. Her embarrassment was adorable, but it actually cheered me up and really allowed me to like enjoy the rest of the evening. And then, you know, then my two guests, we went upstairs and, and had some fun up there. So, but I wanted to, I want to give a shout out to Courtney. You are, you're not disloyal for accidentally making out with my ex-girlfriend. Uh, in fact, you are great and really helped turn my night around. So thank you for that. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, th- I've got this week's Man Whore Con announcement, some new news to share with you. I've mentioned this, uh, this whole Man Whore Con scholarship fund thing over the past couple months, right? As of today, over $500 has been donated to send one lucky listener to hang out with me in New York City. It's, it's fucking bonkers, right? Now, uh, now is finally the time. I know some people have been asking, but now I want to share with you how you can win a free trip to Manorcon this August. I want to see who isn't shy about loving this show. I want to see who isn't shy about loving the show. So to enter, send me a video explaining how, showing, not just explaining, show me how you share the Man Whore podcast with the world, and tell me why I should select you to join us in August. Videos need to be submitted by June 1st to be considered. Arbitrary points will be awarded for creativity, shamelessness, humor, and celebrity endorsement. To submit, uh, send your video, no more than five minutes, please, to manwhorepod at gmail.com. I'm supposed to say this next part. Uh, By submitting, you agree to let me post your video on social media if I so choose. Uh, It will remain untagged if you prefer. Now, not to go give you ideas, but, you know. But, hey, this could be... I I want you to kind of explore the space with this. It's vague for a reason, okay? This could be a big-ass sign on your freeway overpass. This could be a slew of Tinder dates gathered at the same bar simply to announce to them they should all leave a five-star rating for me. This could be a person on the street segment, or it could be getting Scott Rogowski to shout it out on HQ. I don't know. I'm I'm just brainstorming here. But uh, that's supposed to be your job. That's how you... Get to earn a free trip to New York City to Manhorcon. Some other pseudo-legal mumbo-jumbo will be explained to the potential winner before I declare my selection. But generally, make sure you are available to travel 
uh, on August 2nd or early on August 3rd and able to stay until the at least the late afternoon of August 5th. And who can submit? Anyone. Yeah. All the genders. All the ages. Geographically, you can be from anywhere. I don't care. Just know that like, if you live in Australia, you'd have to cover the difference in your airfare. And if you live in New York City, well, maybe the money is going to cover an Airbnb closer to the events and uh, some meal money. We'll figure all that out later, but there's no income requirement, no application. Just show me why you're my biggest fan. And if you'd like to contribute to the Man Horkon Scholarship Fund, we are still accepting donations this month. Shoot me an email, and I'll tell you how you can help send one lucky listener to New York City. $10, $20, $100, whatever's clever, all right? Thank you to everyone who made this happen thus far. It's pretty fucking cool that we get to do this. I don't don't really know a lot of shows that get their listeners to help send another listener to their events. So that's dope. Uh, One more time. Send a video under five minutes to manwhorepod at gmail.com displaying how you creatively spread the word about the Manwhore podcast and why I should select you by June 1st. Um, you know, the, look, we've been, I've mentioned uh, several times on the podcast, I've mentioned FOSTA and SESTA, the uh, really, really shitty anti sex worker legislation as been masquerading as uh, saving the victims of sex trafficking. And we will be talking more about FOSTA and SESTA in the coming weeks. Next week, actually, we have my guest will be one of my uh, a woman I went on a Tinder date with who, let's just say FOSTA and SESTA is affecting her. But, you know, like, let's get selfish for a moment. FOSTA SESTA can kind of affect me, too. If you don't care about sex workers' rights, which you should, but let's say you don't, let's say it's not your priority, you should care about this legislation from a free speech and free internet standpoint, and here's why. FOSTA SESTA uh, will punish, if you're not familiar with the legislation, it punishes any website or hosting platform or whatever that allows or doesn't uh, take action against sex workers or anyone quote promoting sex work the language in this bit law is super fucking vague i promote sex work because i say hey sex work should be decriminalized hey happy end massages are fucking fantastic i say shit like that that's technically promoting sex work now i wouldn't be prosecuted for such a thing but what this law does and we talk about it more next week is it puts the pressure on websites like Craigslist, like Twitter, like Instagram, like Apple with iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to this show. It allows the government to put pressure on them to silence voices, you know, silence sex worker voices. But in in theory, they can also silence mine. They could say, Apple, you need to take down uh, any shows that promote sex work from iTunes. And then I'm gone. The government is basically saying, we're going to make these other websites do our dirty work for us. So what happens if I go away? This is all a big, long-winded thing to say, you should sign up for my mailing list. Yeah, I know this is a little shitty to do. I'm sorry, but it's, it's kind of necessary. If anything, I'm trying to uh, combine the reality that this vague fucking language is an attack on free speech and free internet with my need to get you to sign up for my mailing list, okay? What if... Tomorrow, Apple takes me off of the thing. They take me down. They take the whore cast down. They take this is um, they take wire people into that down. They take all the cool, awesome sex positive shows that promote sex work down. What happens to you? Uh, how do you find me? Sign up for my mailing list and you will know how to find and, and consume and continue to listen to this podcast. You can sign up for my mailing list by going to manwhorepod.com. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet on the right-hand side. If you're on a desktop, it's at the bottom of this of the website. If you're on mobile, sign up for that so uh, you never miss out on any man or podcast news. Hopefully, that won't happen. Hopefully, the news that you'll be getting in your inbox from me will only be wonderful, awesome, happy things. But just in case shit goes south, you're covered. Before we get to uh, this week's guest, Emily Linden, I just want to 
let y'all know we have an exclusive bonus episode of the Man Whore Podcast with soon-to-be retired porn starlet Kendra Sunderland. Yeah, I recorded with her at AVN back in January, and that episode is available exclusively to my $10 and up members on Patreon. She uh she is finally this is this was her last AVN. This was her last adult entertainment expo. Uh if you don't know who Kendra Sunderland is, she was uh the a few years back, uh, she got arrested very, kind of famously at her I think she went to the University of Oregon. She was arrested for when she got caught doing a cam show in her school library. Yeah. She got arrested for that. I think she got like probation or something. And uh <laughs> then and that kind of launched her stardom into the uh the porn world from just camming. So I sat down and chatted with her, and you can get access to that bonus episode as well as nearly a hundred other bonus episodes when you sign up at patreon.com slash man whore podcast. Membership is a fantastic way to support this show and keep the lights on over my head, okay, which uh, which I just found out that my utilities bill is way higher than expected because we have an electric boiler. So yeah, literally need to keep the lights on here. Um, <laughs> so again, patreon.com slash man or podcast, you get to support the show, you get access to exclusive fan whore communities, and you'll get to hear my bonus episode with Kendra Sunderland. And you can also go check out Kendra if you're not familiar with her or if you're very intimately familiar with her. You can go check her out on social media. She is uh, at the real Kendra on Instagram. She is uh, at KS Library Girl on Twitter. And you can go ahead and buy her Snapchats at buykendrasnap.com. And now for this week's guest, Emily Linden. Uh, this this episode has actually been years in the making. I've been trying to record with Emily for years. Uh, she, she was one of the original special guests that I had eyeballed being like, ooh, I want to talk to you. I love what you do. Emily Linden is the founder of The Unslut Project. From the website, uh, her about section, it reads, The Unslut Project promotes gender equality, sex positivity, and comprehensive age-appropriate sex education for all ages. This is a collaborative space for sharing stories and creating awareness about sexual bullying, slut-shaming, and related issues. It is up to each of us to evaluate and take responsibility for our own assumptions and interactions. Since launching The Unslut Project, she has created a documentary of the same name, she has published a book, which is uh, she published her diaries from sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. They are a beautiful, uh, sometimes heartbreaking look into the mind and feelings of a coming of age young woman. Um, I read the book years ago and just I, I wept on the subway. Beautiful stuff. Uh, so I'm so excited to finally share a zip code with uh, Emily back when I was in the Bay Area uh, in February. And I think you're really going to enjoy this show. Uh, she does fantastic work, and I hope you are all following her on all the things and checking out her projects. Let's go ahead and talk about slut shaming with Emily Linden. Yeah, I just like to hold on just in case I'm going to fall over from uh, whatever it is <laughs> that I'm battling up there. Who knows? Uh, I'll, I'll say one more time while I'm here with Emily Linden from the Unslut Project. Uh, nice to finally be me and you in person. Yes. Agreed. Nice to meet you, too. Yes. Uh, g can you tell us in a few words just what the Unslut Project is? Yeah. Um, almost five years ago now, I decided to put my middle school diaries online. And the reason I did that was because I had heard news stories about girls who had been sexually assaulted uh, or were being sexually harassed, labeled the school slut, basically. Um, and because of that type of sexual bullying had taken their own lives. And I could relate. I had gone through something similar in middle school. So I decided at the age of 27 to share my diary online. And I added some commentary, some annotation. And I just kind of expected it to be that, just kind of a little blog, um, something odd that I had never seen before. But what happened was uninvited. People started getting in touch with me and submitting their own stories and telling me, you know, I can relate. I've been through that. People who were like, in their 70s and girls who were in their teens and younger. So I realized um, my story, you know, that of a, of a New England 
rather upper middle class white lady can't really stand in for what it means to be sexually harassed, sexually bullied and targeted in this way. Um, and so the Unslet Project need to be kind of a collective of a lot of different people's stories. And that's what it is. Now it exists online as a community where people submit stories all the time about having overcome any type of sexual harassment or um, slut shaming. A lot of it involves sexual assault, unfortunately. Mm. Uh, people from all different backgrounds and ages. And and it's really, it's really in a lot of ways contributed and snowballed up to the Me Too movement we're in now. So I'm really proud of that. I was going to say, did you get like a spike? Did, uh, did things maybe... Did you get more submissions like since everything's been coming out since Harvey Weinstein since Louis? Yes. Yeah, I have. And actually, I haven't been posting submissions recently. Um, I've had some of my own uh, social media chatter that has um, made me hesitant to um, to risk submitting uh, some of the people who have shared their stories to harassment online, you know, that's targeted toward me. Um, I don't want to be posting stories and have those posters feel that they're being attacked because of some of the negativity that's directed toward me and the project just in the past couple of months. Yeah. Um, but you're referring to, uh, your, your Twitter storm about the, the me too movement. And there's a, apparently you hate men. That's what I heard. Someone told me, no, um, <laughs> what, I, that's what I've heard too. <laughs> what, what happened with all that? All, Cause again, I, we keep in touch like every, you know, a couple times a year through an email, yeah. check in, how you doing? All of a sudden, a few months ago, I see you in the news, yeah. and this time, like you're in trouble. I'd love what to did, talk with you about this. Yeah, what did you what did you say? I purposefully didn't look much because, like, <laughs> uh, someone's like, she said that she doesn't care if dudes go to jail falsely accused. I was like, that's probably not fully accurate. Yeah. Uh, what? <laughs> that's not fully accurate. Yeah. I, mean, I said what I feel, which is that I'm not um, concerned with innocent men losing their jobs. So nobody mentioned jail until Donald Trump Jr. tweeted, which is perhaps a bit of a Freudian slip on his mm -hmm. part, but nobody brought jail into it sure. until he retweeted with that. Jail's on the mind of the Trump <laughs> family a lot these yeah. days. Um, but what my tweet was in response to was kind of a pushback I felt in conversations where um, – mostly straight guys, but actually people of all genders and orientations will say something along the lines of like, well, it's really great that all these women are coming forward and we're learning so much about what it's like to like be a woman in the workforce and all that you guys are up against. But we don't want it to go too far because like, because like, what if like a, a guy gets wrongly accused? What if someone loses their job? Mm. And to me, like that is very frustrating because it's a, it's a way to it strikes me in the worst cases as a deliberate way to derail the Me Too conversation, mm -hmm. like don't go too far. And it's also a little <laughs> bit obtuse because obviously nobody wants to punish innocent people. Nobody is going around like trying to um, make up lies to vilify men in general. And this is this kind of straw woman feminist figure that – historically has been used against women a lot. It's mm. been used against me in the past. This idea that that's my goal. It's not. And I think it's really disingenuous for people to pretend that that's a risk. Um, we are living right now in a reality where these Me Too stories are almost, I mean, they're ubiquitous. They're everywhere. Almost every woman you talk to has one, you know? And I have yet to hear, I mean, maybe a handful of of prominent men, but really not many careers have been destroyed, let alone lives. Mm. So it is a risk, but I think it's disingenuous to pretend that that risk hasn't already been like what we're all operating um, in order to, you know, take into consideration. We're all constantly afraid of this hypothetical man's career that might be destroyed by a false allegation. And that's why we don't take women seriously. You the, know, that's the true the allegations quo. barely ruin careers like only recently i think have careers been maybe ruined and time is only going to tell on some of these oh yeah i doubt uh, he's on zari for instance i bet he writes a book about this whole experience and is fine honestly yeah like his career is not ruined um i mean that's an example that has come up a lot in conversation obviously it's a fraught example um but even you know much more I would, cut I would, and dry oh go ahead well i was gonna say i mean aziz and aziz is i didn't read the babe article because like just another one it's but from what i could gather it just seemed like a dude was a fucking idiot. My thing with Aziz is like why I think he needs to be burnt a little more for is like 
you wrote a fucking book yeah. on not you just not just dating on modern dating you on consent know. heavy dating like you should know better um uh, cuz if it was fucking i don't know who's a good equivalent I don't know. Some like, it, even if he's a nice guy, but he hasn't, John Mulaney hasn't written a book sure. on modern dating. So if it was something where someone is misreading cues and shit, I'm a, I'm less like, Hey, let's ruin someone's career over like some like dumb stuff. Cause it's not like he pretend, Aziz, you pretend to be authority on the thing. Like, right. you know, that was my thing with Aziz, but someone like a Harvey or a Louis CK, the, you know, these things. Careers have barely been ruined. Right. And, and yeah. who knows? 10 years from now, Harvey might be back. Right. Oh, gosh. Getting I, Meryl I, to win <laughs> Oscars again. You never know. I, gosh, my heart breaks at that prospect. But I feel like even... I mean, the, the thing that's so sad to me about the Aziz Ansari situation is that it's so normal, you know? I've had conversations with, you know, like my husband and his friends where they're sitting around kind of asking me as you know, some kind of feminist authority, like, but that's not that bad, right? Right? As the woman in the room. <laughs> right. And also because they see themselves in it, I think, a little bit. I think we're getting to the point, um, and I retweeted a great article about this recently, where it's becoming, you know, it's not just the Harvey Weinsteins. It's not just the monsters, the people who are obviously, you know, antagonists in horror movie type characters. Right. It's everyday dudes who never got sex ed. You right. know, and who don't know about consent. And it's, we're getting to that point now, which I think is, you know, as a culture, a good point to be at, where we're kind of looking at ourselves and questioning, how do I participate in this? And that goes for people of all genders. Yeah. And I thought it was going to be, uh, you know, the rising rates of STIs whenever they introduce abstinence only sex ed. I thought maybe that would be a thing that would get us to get sex ed in schools. That wasn't a thing. Maybe this will be it. Yeah. Maybe um, preventing sexual assault. I mean, if people can see it that way, however, we can get. You know, sex and yeah, sex and school. So I'm I'm down. That and that was again my response to the Z's thing was without even reading it, just with getting the some of the details of everyone was like, oh, he didn't rape her, but like he was shitty, and, and she could have said no, but didn't. But I kind of get all that stuff. I was like, sounds like we need sex ed in schools. Yeah. Sounds like this will all get fixed with it. What yeah. was your sex ed in in school like? Well, I went to a public school in Massachusetts. That was great, but we had um rather. I remember we were we had something called the puberty program, which was a little bit late for me because mm -hmm. uh, I went through puberty early. Um, and then in high school, we had sex ed classes, but they were always kind of a joke. You know, they were wrapped up in health generally. And um, nobody took them very seriously. It was – the programming was not um, kind of presented in a way that was relevant to our lives. Mm -hmm. It wasn't abstinence only, but it was very kind of dated and it was clear – None of us was taking what we learned in class and applying it in any way. It wasn't comprehensive, <laughs> right? No. Yeah. Oh, no, not at all. It was something so you could say you did it. Yeah, check the but box. But that was it. Check I the think that's what it is for a lot of people around this country. That's what I found traveling around, um, you know, North America. In fact, actually, different provinces in Canada have figured it out a little bit better than we have. And oh, actually, really? state by state, it varies too. Iowa has done a lot of great things. I had went to a wonderful... Um, conference in Iowa where I was really, really impressed with a lot of the sex educators there and the strides they've taken. But it really depends, not just like state by state, school district to school district and and school to school. You know, it depends on a, a guidance counselor who's going to go out and get the materials or teachers who are really gung-ho about it and ready to get parental permission. And it really shouldn't. That's not fair to the kids who don't live in those school districts, who don't happen to have a motivated teacher, you know? Or who have parents who say, no, you, my kid can't sit in on that. Yeah, parents do not do sex ed. <laughs> yeah, and you know what it is, is a lot of them go like, no, that's a f at home thing, we'll teach that. But, but you don't, don't right. right? The people who say that do not do the teaching, mm -hmm. I have found. And that's not, you know, that's a generalization. But I found people who are against sex ed in schools are also against sex ed in general. And sexual, uh, I don't know the right word for it. I guess sexual expression generally. <laughs> freedom, yeah. A little bit, yeah. Sexual freedom generally. Yeah, and well, it's also they don't know what to teach because they weren't yeah. taught it. And I'd be, I'd be okay if we made sex ed like optional in school where like the parents could opt out and say we want to do it our way. I'd be okay with that. I don't know, 40, 50 years from yeah. now if we started now. Hey, because, that's a good call. Yeah. Right, because then at least we would have a couple generations that they know enough to teach their own kid. That's true. But right now, like nah, no one knows shit. No, it's absolutely true. I feel like even adults, I mean, that's why we need to have adult sex educators because we speak to 
um, the one thing when I speak to um, students at high schools and mm. I'm talking to them about going out into the world, being a sexual creature in the future, if they're not already, um, is that they're, you know, maybe if they have sex with each other, they'll be fine. But say after they graduate high school, wherever they go in their lives, the people that they're interacting with and they're having sex with haven't necessarily had that educational opportunity. So it's really, you know, important to stress, you're going to have to talk about consent if you you know, if you're listening, if you know about consent, mm. you have to talk about it. All of us have to all the time because we can't assume that the people that we interact with have any type of consent education at all. It is time for our Did You Know segment brought to you by HotMovies.com. Oh, yeah. This is where we give you five facts about the adult industry that you may or may not know. HotMovies.com is a great place to pay for your porn in a ethical and affordable manner, uh, hotmovies.com is a pay per minute site. I have personally been using hotmovies.com for my porn viewing uh, with my free minutes that they provided to me when I signed up at manwhorepod.com slash hotmovies. And I, I, my, my half empty bottle of lube is my proof that I'm enjoying it. Yeah. And so we, we, we thank Hot Movies for supporting this podcast. So now I want to do some did you knows. Okay, did you know? Did you know Charlotte Stokely spent seven years as a fashion model for American Apparel? Did you know a woman has twice as many nerve endings on her clitoris than men have on their whole penis? Seems like we kind of got the short end of the stick on that one. Did you know Prince Yeshua once broke his dick on set? Oh my, I'm very curious if the video of that is available on hotmovies.com because I think I'd watch that. I'd pay to watch a man break his dick just to see what it looks like, just to know what to avoid. Did you know Mercedes Carrera went to college for engineering and technology and worked in aerospace for a few years before entering porn? Goes to show you, they're not just a bunch of dumb whores, okay? Just sex sometimes is a lot more interesting than engineering. And finally, did you know trans performer Karen Dior guest starred and directed an episode of Xena Warrior Princess? Okay, that's a cool one. That's a fun one. I like that one. That's a fun fact to me. <laughs> Hotmovies.com features the largest adult video library available online featuring movies from vintage 8mm films to the very latest and greatest films being released today. There's always something to see, to do, and to learn at hotmovies.com. Yeah, you know, I go to my porn sites to learn. It's that's that's the new that's the new hey, I'm just reading Playboy for the articles, okay? <laughs> and again, ex- my listeners, Manhor podcast fans can enjoy 20 free minutes when you use the promo code manhor when you sign up for any package at hotmovies.com. Now, some of you may go to the website and go like, "Billy, they it looks like they're giving away 20 free minutes." Oh yeah, I know that. I negotiated 20 more minutes just for my man whore fans. You can go go ahead and sign up for free. No hidden costs, no secret recurring things. You get 40 free minutes on the house to try it out when you sign up at manwhorepod.com slash hotmovies and sign up for the free trial. Again, that's manwhorepod.com slash hotmovies. Now let's get back to the show. Because in adults, a lot of the – any sex ed for adults like, uh, is always, like, pleasure-based. It's, like, how to do better blowjobs. Yeah. I think consent is starting to become part of adult sex ed workshops now, and that's yeah. great. But there's no stuff about, like, here are all the different STIs. This is, you know, how this is contracted. This comes protect against X, Y, and Z, but doesn't uh, protect against A, B, and C. We don't have adult sex ed, like, fact factual stuff. And I think yeah. more than just, like – what we generally think of as sex ed for adults and for all of us, what we need to like take responsibility for Mm. is the nitty gritty in the moment, individual one-on-one sexual interaction. Like that stuff that you never talk about. I've found even with my best girlfriends, you know, you don't know what's normal when it comes to sex. None of us does. We only know what's normal for us (laughs) and what we do and what we've seen and what other people choose to share with us and show us, you know? And I feel like if we don't kind of, normalize discussing consent if we don't normalize women i mean it goes both ways but i'm I, you know in when we're talking about you know in the me too movement clearly it's usually women who are the victims of sexual assault um and and, and we're talking about 
being able to speak up for yourself in the moment. It's not just me sitting here talking to you on this podcast. You know, it's not just like people talking on NPR. It's not just people deciding to wear a certain outfit at an awards show. It's in the heat of the moment when it comes down to it, using your voice, finding the power inside you to say, I don't like that. I'm not into that. Or not this time, whatever it is to you, whatever that redirection is to you, that's something that we don't practice and we don't, we don't really hold ourselves accountable to. Um, this doesn't say it's going to stop a sexual assault. If someone's going to sexually assault you, it has nothing to do with you. Mm. Um, I'm talking about consensual sexual activity that can be a lot more fun right. and enjoyable for everyone. Um, it can lead to orgasm every time for most women. Wow. Yeah. Imagine, you know, it can be good sex, not just, you know, sex where I wasn't um, traumatized, which right. is, I guess, I guess, the bar we hold most sex to for women. And the cousin I'm crashing with, like, she, uh, she's like 21 and we were talking and she doesn't seem to, she seems shocked that like sex can be good uh, she, or like fun. So... She goes like, oh, you know, I guess like if I don't want to have sex, like I kind of just like let them do it and I hope that it doesn't hurt much. And I, I'm like, oh, honey, like, no, you just tell them like, I don't want to fuck. She's like, but I feel bad. I was like, you shouldn't. And I think women will naturally start to speak up in bed like that when we give women the permission and raise them to also speak up in the workplace or uh, about non-sexual things about like, I deserve this raise. Um, I deserve this to just, I don't know, be like they raised me to be naturally, I yeah. guess. And also, um, it's a matter of all of us women agreeing to do it mm -hmm. uh, when we're having heterosexual relationships. So, for instance, like if I'm going to hook up with a new guy and I know that every woman he's ever hooked up with has spoken up for herself and, and advocated and that's what he expects, then I feel like that's expected of me, too. And I can I feel less like I need to not, you know, tiptoe around his feelings or whatever we're conditioned to think. We need no scabs. OK, yeah, no, <laughs> no scabs. You're going to ruin Hold it for everybody. Line. Hold, <laughs> Hold the line. The line. <laughs> It's so true. We and need it, a Jimmy Hoffa for honestly, women in bed. No, and it's true for men too. It's honestly like, um, I think the disclaimer that goes without saying is we're talking about like very normalized or normative straight sex here. But like dudes need to hold each other accountable. I'm talking about like everyday casual conversations yeah. when it gets a little off, not like a description of a clear rape, but – um, most straight friends that I know, straight dudes will sit around and be like, yeah, uh, that didn't sound so bad to me. Or like, did I somehow do that? And I don't know. But you can obviously, I'm, I'm telling yeah. you about yourself. So speak to me or, you know, <laughs> speak to me as a dude. But like, it seems that you've got to, you've got to get over that fear of being like a nerd or, a, or like a, a, not nerd isn't the right word, like a, a dork or a dork. Yeah. Like, Dude, aren't or, you? Or not, I've, not as I've been that. called a bitch boy feminist. Yeah, bitch pet. boy feminist. Yeah, sure, which whatever. is weird because I've never called myself a feminist, and right. yeah, I get accused of it daily. <laughs> um, no, but like honestly, like just get over the fear of like friends, best friends, brothers, yeah. whoever, rolling their eyes at you and being like, "Oh, maybe you're, I don't know, a cuck. Maybe you're, I don't know, not so good in bed. Whatever they're gonna make fun of you for." Your like awkwardness in that moment could save a woman from getting raped, yeah. like straight up. The next woman he goes and thinks he's having consensual sex with or whatever. So that I think is really we have to hold men accountable to. Because and, and obviously like the and I, I hate doing the thing where I try to differentiate types of rape, but like different types of non consensual crap. There's like violent rapists is a different case, but I think a lot of men don't want to rape. And I think yeah. a lot, and, and this is the heartbreaking thing when it comes to sex ed is I think that there are dudes who have raped and don't realize it. I think there are women who think they've been raped and weren't technically, but, and then most tragically, I think there are women who have been raped and have no fucking idea because they yeah. think that's just what they're supposed to do. Yeah. But I think when, if, when us guys talk up and speak up, we can get this understanding of what consent is. So, cause I think again, most of us don't want to, have non-consensual sex i think not a lot of us realize what that means right and so those conversations they're starting to happen which is good yeah um i think like things like aziz gang put up into the the public flogging yeah. brings up the conversation and it lets guys realize oh fuck there are non-verbal cues i'm supposed to pay attention to yeah so like yes could that woman say no 
sure, but let's focus on the parts that you can control. And, right. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like when I hear a lot of these discussions kind of picking it apart. Oh, she didn't say no. Oh, but if she doesn't say no, how am I supposed to know? And again, that feels pretty disingenuous. It's like if you are trying to convince whatever Twitter audience mm. of the nuances of sexual assault to try to, I don't know, make the point that like she deserved it or she didn't do enough – what does that say about you? Like, what is your motivation? Because why wouldn't you just err on the side of not sexually assaulting someone? Right. You know, just ask if you've got a question. I don't know if she's, if you're getting a nonverbal cue, I feel like we're kind of conditioned to just say, well, the end all be all is, you know, you got to get laid. Whatever you got to mm -hmm. do to get laid, just like do it. And that's not, that, that paradigm needs to change. Like that cannot be the, um, the goal that all else can be sacrificed for. We have to have like fair, um, equitable orgasms. <laughs> we need yeah. to have community. Close the orgasm yeah. gap. Uh, <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> uh, that's, Honestly. it's the gap we don't seem to talk about enough. W yeah. When did you in your personal life figure out how to like stand up and say for your, you know, advocate for your orgasms or your pleasure or your bodily autonomy? God forbid. Um, it wasn't during my uh, promiscuous phase in college, I'll tell you that much. Mm. Actually, looking back now on when I kind of had the most sex with the most casual partners, a lot of it was coerced. A lot of it I don't feel comfortable with in hindsight um, and kind of in the moment remember differently or framed differently to myself. I think that's the experience of a lot of a lot of women I've talked to. Um, drunk, I'm like drunken college ago. encounters. Some of it drunken. Some yeah. of it just um, feeling like I was performing in like a porn that I thought they might have seen mm -hmm. type of sex, um, and not advocating for my own pleasure. Not thinking at all that you know what my face really looks like when I'm enjoying myself might be an okay way to look during sex. Right. That would never have occurred to me. Um, that type of men mentality, I think, is quite common. So I guess it was probably not till mid twenties. I don't know. I had a boyfriend in my mid twenties. I hardly ever came with, um, and I never talked to him about it. I was too polite. I guess is this just sad word? And actually, this reminds me uh, something you said earlier about women being polite. Reminds me of. Do you ever watch um, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt? Uh, I did the first season. Okay, bit, so yeah. you remember then when, ironically, Matt Lauer is interviewing like the mole women. <laughs> oh, oh. The premise is they've just come up from being kidnapped <laughs> yeah. by a zealot, you know, preacher underground and they've been rescued. And Matt, they, you know, they're all kind of describing how they got kidnapped. And one of them describes being pulled into a van because this this preacher came to her restaurant and, you know, he started telling her, the story and he wanted to tell her more. He invited her out to his van and she didn't want to be impolite. Mm -hmm. And Matt Lauer says as himself in the show, wow, it's always amazing to me the extent that women will go to, to avoid being impolite. Well, this woman has just been captured for like eight years or, or over a decade, I think underground because she was polite. <laughs> Matt and Lauer who had an auto lock right. button in his office. Right. Yeah. Oh gosh. <laughs> now you watch that and it's a whole other meaning, but I mean, it really, um, it really is true. We're really yeah. conditioned to like not make other people uncomfortable, even at the expense of our own safety and our own well-being. And, um, you know, to some extent, I think it's good that we're talking about that because it, it helps us. It helps. It's really useful to have a nuanced conversation about what we mean when we talk about like personal responsibility and sexual assault. Right. Because right. we don't mean you're victim blaming. We don't ever mean it's your fault for being attacked. Um, and a lot of people do mean that and say that. And unfortunately, you know, I have to clarify that. Um, but when we're talking about consensual sexual interactions, we're talking about advocating for yourself. Now we're at the nitty gritty where we can actually make progress there. And, and yeah, I really, really hope we do because, um, I feel like the, the conversation has nuance to it. And if we can bring more people onto the yeah. side of talking, you know, openly about sex, then that's better for, for everyone, yeah. you know, for all of their partners too. Yeah. Uh, when, so when did you, I guess, so to speak, say like, get more bitchy and less polite in bed? <laughs> like, was it with... Well, I never got bitchy. I mean, that's Well, I mean, I mean, I mean, saying like being impolite, like, uh, cause it, God forbid you weren't being polite with like, then she was a bitch. Uh, but I, you know, obviously I don't mean that. I mean, like, when did you, was it, was it with like the husband? Was it before, like, did you arrive yeah. to this, 
uh, relationship like ready to speak or was there still growing pains by the time you met the person would become a life partner? This is kind of personal exclusive, but here you go. I I met my husband by deciding I was just going to do like online dating kind of methodically. Okay. Just go to coffee with a bunch of guys till I found my partner. <laughs> that ended up being narrowed down to like you know, handful of guys who I ended up being intimate with mm-hmm. and few of them I had sex with. This is a bracket style competition. Was oh, this totally. The, I like, had a p- whiteboard. Final four. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Did Obama make his selections every year uh, on ESPN? He's like, you know, I do. Th- I think Jim's going to make it over Andy and in, in the Elite Eight. <laughs> no, absolutely not. But I was thinking, you know, I want, I'm ready. I had just broken up with this guy I was telling you about yeah. who didn't give me orgasms when we had sex and I didn't. It wasn't just like his fault for not giving me orgasms. I didn't feel able to communicate about it. And that was a problem. You know, I felt something was wrong with our relationship. So that had just ended. And I thought, never again. Like, if I'm going to, that's one reason I could not have made him my permanent monogamous partner because I want to have orgasms when I have sex with with one person, you know, for the rest of my life. How dare you be so selfish? Right? (laughs) Heaven forbid. So, yeah. So that's what I, that was kind of where I, I decided I'm going to be having, you know, quasi casual sex, but not really Mm because I'm thinking this is going to be kind of on the way to search for my life partner. You know, I want us to be compatible in this way. Mm. And I decided I'm not going to be able to like fake it for the rest of my freaking life. You know, I'm not going to be able to look sexy or what I think of as, you know, typically, you know, performative sexiness forever. I need to be able to turn that off. And I just decided to do that. And so luckily, yeah, the dude I ended up with thinks my normal O face is pretty good looking, I guess. He knocked me up. I guess. Your normal O face is pretty good looking. I don't know. I don't need to pretend anything. <laughs> it's great. And honestly, like, probably I never mm. did have to pretend. And that's what I think is really important. But it's like, it's such a shame that I wasted a lot of my sexually active years performing something I thought was, like, expected of me. When, if again, if all of us kind of hold the line, just enjoy ourselves, ask for what we want, that will become normal and we won't, there will be nothing to perform, you know, nothing to kind of pretend about. Right. Were you ever worried that like uh, demanding orgasms, de- demanding pleasure, de- demanding equality, say, would lead to some sort of slut shaming? Uh, would like say, like, I want this. And he's like, whoa, you want that? <sighs> what a skank. It has. Yeah? yeah. And actually, one of the first times I was in grad school, I was hooking up with this guy who I really liked. And, um, Finally, we got to hook up and I was so excited, you know, and, and it wasn't great. In fact, it, it like wasn't even good. Um, and I was disappointed. But we, you know, I liked him and I wanted our sex to be good because I wanted to date him. Mm. So a couple weeks of this went on and finally I I thought so hard about like how to bring this up in a kind way. And and I did. And I, and I brought it up by asking him. I decided and I, I remember this instead of asking like this is what I want. I asked him, you know, is there anything that you want? Like, is there anything that you want that we're not doing? thinking that he would say something and then I could be like, okay, my turn. <laughs> right. Everything needs to change. <laughs> no, you know, whatever. Um, so I did. And he was like, oh, I don't know. I think it's fine the way it is. You know, clearly. He- I'm coming. So that's that's pretty good. Yeah, he, exactly. That was his approach to it, you know. And I said, oh, really? Are you sure? Like nothing that I can do for you? And he got kind of irritated. I could tell he was getting like a little pissed off. And he was like, no, I said, it's fine. Like, I don't really want to talk about this. Like the whole concept right. of talking about it was irritating to him. And I said, you've got me like naked in front of you saying, I'll do anything, you anything. know, like, what do you want me to do? Yeah. And I was kind of saying it again, playfully. And he, his whole face changed. And he said, you would do anything for anyone. And he put on his clothes and left. And it was like, I will never forget. It was horrible. And this was a guy, like, again, I'm, I told you I was naked. Yeah. This person, like, totally. You're at your most vulnerable yeah. state you could be in. And also, like, I had put a lot of thought into how, into bringing up that conversation with him. I don't feel bad about that at all. I think it's kind of a funny story. It's sad on, you know, for him. But mm-hmm. for me, you know, that was good information to have. <laughs> Glad I didn't, I don't know, marry him without first seeing if we were sexually compatible. It would have right. been horrible. But I think that's a lot of people's approach to it. And that, you know, that's the only time it's happened to me. But I'm glad it did happen because after that, I wasn't afraid of it anymore. I was like, oh, that's the worst that can happen. They will slut shame me and, and straight up leave. <laughs> right. And, uh, and you know, that's okay. I didn't want to have sex with them anyway then, you know? All right. <laughs> so, I mean, honestly, I, I am so glad that I got to that point and I really wish I had earlier. Yeah. Well, you had this book, um, 
that I came across kind of randomly. I used to work at a um, a magazine and they just get a bunch of like free books would just like pile up. And I remember coming across your book and then this looks interesting. And I read this, you know, these, the sixth, seventh and eighth grade diaries of yours. And I remember, I was like heartbroken. And the the book is called slut right? or am I mixing them up? Cause I know that slut, yeah. (laughs) because isn't the, the documentaries one and the books, the other, right? They ended up both being unslut, but it is a story. Slut was, I have a, I think I have like a press copy of it. Yeah. You funded it when it was called slut on Kickstarter. We had to change it because it was misleading and it sounded like it might be a porn, but. You were talking about right. the book. <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, so so the the book uh, so heartbreaking, and what I loved was the choice to not edit the language. That's the thing. The first thing I ever tell people about the book is I, I tell them the premise of it, and then I say she didn't change the language. Like oh, she, yeah. you changed names and like locations, names, yeah. and I think it cleaned up probably some uh, some spelling errors that yeah. one probably had when they were twelve, yeah. but. You kept it in the the natural words and language you used while you were experienced sexual bullying, the slut shaming, assault, and it's uh, it was it pulled at me. And so I remember distinctly crying on the subway, reading when I think it's like after right after you had the the boy did that terrible thing to you, um, and I was like, whoa, this is fucking intense. It's a phenomenal book. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and and. Uh, you know, what was it like to finally first put those out there into the world? Well, it was important to me to keep it in those words. I'm glad you brought that up because that was the way that I had rationalized it. You know, I figured a lot of adults want to work with young women who go through sexual assault or who go through sexual harassment or who, you know, in any way have any type of self-esteem issues, let's say. But it's hard to know you know, what it's like inside their minds. It's hard to put ourselves back in middle school or back in high school now knowing what we know and having the perspective (coughs) that we have. So it was important to me to maintain that, you know, word for word, what I wrote in my diary, again, you said the names were changed to protect people, but that's honestly it. And you can tell when you read it. I mean, there are some really silly bits that I would have liked to take out. Some bits I would have liked to take out because they were disparaging. I used the word retarded. I used the word gay to mean mm-hmm. stupid, which I, you know, was part of my vocabulary, unfortunately, in the late 90s. And, you know, I left that in um, and commented upon it just because it's honest and because it, um, I didn't want to kind of make myself into any more of a perfect victim. Um, I didn't want to kind of obscure any of the ways that I bullied other people because that was an important way that I coped with being bullied. Mm. You know, it's really messy and it's com- complicated. And I think it's important to leave all that in. It's a diary. I mean, that's what it is. Otherwise, what's the point, you know? Yeah. And then and then after the book, you have you had this wonderful documentary. Yeah, we're still screening it. <laughs> and um and yeah, that was, used to be called Slut. So you were one of our backers when we did right. a Kickstarter and uh, later Seed and Spark, a completely crowdfunded film. And I'm so proud of it. And so um, we are still, I'm screening it um, this coming month at University of Kentucky. We have a screening coming up at University of Ohio, um, no, Ohio State. Um, and high schools are screening it all over the country still. It's wonderful. It's an educational distribution. And so um, people can incorporate it into comprehensive sex ed programs. And we're talking about starting conversations about personal experiences. The film is a really good way to to get that going. Did you find any uh, different types of uh, slut shaming experiences than you personally experienced? Say, like as like a white chick in New England. Like, did you find like other people in different parts of the country had different types of experiences that were all at the core of the same like sexual shaming? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't even the core. The only thing they have in common is the is the tendency to blame ourselves, you mm. know, and to and to look in ourselves for something that's like wrong with us or that needs to be changed because of the way the the world treats us, I guess. Um, that's really the only common thread, I would say. They're so diverse, so diverse. And and a lot of times class plays into it. Racial uh, bigotry often plays into it. Um, some people are sexually bullied, you know, because they're gay and they come out in high school or someone kind of suspects they're gay or, or suspects that they're queer in some way and, and uses that as a way to bully them. I mean, sexual bullying is just as diverse as <laughs> sexuality, yeah. I guess, because the person doing the bullying, honestly, is just kind of twisting whatever fear or hang up they have into something to use against someone else. What have you learned like touring the the doc as you have over the years? That has been my favorite part. And, um, you know, 
the danger involved in traveling has been so discouraging to me because traveling around and meeting high school students and and girls who are, have recently gone through this or who are currently kind of coping with being sexually harassed at school or um you know having been the victim of a sexual assault meeting them in person and sometimes being like the first person they've ever spoken to about this is the only way that I can continue to be an activist. Like it's the only way that I can go on Twitter and like interact with anyone is because I have looked at these people in the face and I've seen them and like cried with them and like listened to them and held them and, and felt this, um, this hope, you know, there's a hope in hearing someone's story and knowing for the first time, you're not the only one. And, being able to share, you know, to bring that feeling to other people who thought they were alone is one of the best parts of my life. I mean, honestly, it's one of the best things I've ever done has been able to is being able to tell my story and only because it, it opens that door for other people. Yeah. And and it, whether even if you don't go through sexual bullying, just bullying in general at that in that age group range, I got to say, I have a heavy history with bullying from like K through eighth grade or K through uh, all high school. So yeah. like your book, like definitely spoke to me. And I was like, so I wasn't called like a slut every day. Um, I definitely was called faggot a few times and beat yeah. up. Uh, so I was like, I, I earned a few dicks if I ever wanted to try. I feel like if you are going to call me it, I should get to try a few, <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, but it, it was a real, real, really powerful stuff, yeah. and I thought it was really important uh, to see from people. But of course, as you've now learned, the the bullying does not end in in grade school and high school. You know, it doesn't. <laughs> but there is something about actually speaking it out loud. You know, there is something common to bullying, and I feel like you know, in our country now, we see it happen on all different levels, and we kind of have become accustomed to a certain public bullying, like in the discourse. Name calling um, has made certainly. a resurgence. Name calling is ridiculous. To 45. Name calling was never allowed in my household. As soon as we used, it, like when I was growing up, as soon as we called someone stupid or as soon as we, you know, turned it into that type of dumbed down argument, it was over. We lost. You know, we were grounded or whatever. Yeah. Um, but there's a feeling that you can kind of. I mean, I don't. I'm sorry to rekindle this in you, but it's when okay. you're when people are talking about you cruelly, when you know you're the only person in a room. You know, you have to be there in that classroom six or seven hours a day and everyone in the room hates you. Nobody wants to sit near you. There's like a physical, almost like crackling of energy and like heat in your ears and your heart feels like it takes up more space in your chest and your your face starts to feel red. And this type of horrifying, like sickening punch to the gut, I don't belong here. I'm alone. I have nobody on my team feeling that we all know and we can all kind of decide when it comes to any interaction, but we're speaking here about sex. So let's say we're speaking about sexual interaction, someone sharing their experience with you or like being vulnerable with you. We have the choice to kind of make them feel that way or to be a friend. And it sounds so simple and silly, but that's really, I think, what it comes down to when we're implementing in our everyday lives, you know? All right, it is time for the fan whore appreciation moment. This is the part of the podcast where I like to give a shout out to some of my members on Patreon. Y'all are the ones who are, well, literally uh, keeping my lights on, keeping a roof over my head and have literally changed my life. And I thank you for it. So right now I want to give a shout out to Raj A., because I do not want to accidentally fuck up your last name, dude. Uh, but you seem like a good old Jersey boy. And we're happy to have you in the champagne room. Shout out to Elizabeth McMullen out in the Midwest. What's up, girl? Big hugs from New York City. And finally, a big thank you to Iris Cole. Uh, girl, your makeup is on point. Tried to do a little bit of research, look into you. And I kind of accidentally got caught up in your Instagram. So, you know, you're doing great. And you, too, can become a member for as little as $1 per month and is a fantastic way to support this very show. Membership gets you access to exclusive fan whore communities on Facebook and Kick. You get access to dozens upon dozens of bonus episodes of the Man Whore Podcast. Join today at patreon.com slash man whore podcast. That's patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash man whore podcast. Now let's wrap up with Emily Linden. 
between the Unslept Project and the book and the documentary, you've also got, you got, and not to mention what happened more recently, but all that stuff for the last years, you've been getting all sorts of shit on the internet too. Do you feel less alone though when, when people, random people on Twitter or people email you be like, oh, you're still a slut, you're this and that? Like, does it feel like you're less alone because you have all these people sharing their stories too? You know, cyber harassment is a whole other animal, but I do feel supported. I feel going through any type of cyber harassment when you have a community of people who know you and who believe in the work that you're doing and who um, are kind of not ready to jump in that nasty name-calling discourse and um, aren't looking for a straw woman feminist figure mm-hmm. to kind of um, hold up as as evil, then then there's a lot of progress to be made. And, and yeah, I do feel supported. And, and beyond that, I mean, I feel I feel like the conversations that we're having are important and useful. And I'm glad to be participating in it. What level of harassment were you getting through making the documentary and putting out the book and the, and having the Unslut Project out there? Will you be surprised? <laughs> well, I mean, I won't be yeah. surprised because you, you've shared some of it with me over the years, like an email, and yeah. some of them freaked me out a bit. But you know, I, these people don't get the email with yeah. you every day. So. so there have been some in-person scares. Yeah. Um, a guy followed me into a bathroom at a screening once, which is pretty scary. Um, and what, someone, what what are they doing? Like, is he saying stuff to you? Like, what's, yeah. what ty- what's that experience like? The guy who followed me into the bathroom just said, asked who I was. When I told him who I was, said, I'm here for you. And put his hand on me. And then a female volunteer had enter, entered the bathroom and told him to leave. It was the women's room. And that, and he left. He left. He didn't even stay for the film. So he wasn't there to watch the screening. And that was the incident actually that really rattled me. Um, because you never know. I mean, so that I mean, people have come up to my hotel room and made it necessary for me to kind of have a safety protocol when I travel and always have someone with me in the parking lot. You know, it just. I mean, like we're, we're film. I mean, for everyone's, we're recording this like in the public, very public, like uh <laughs> lounge of, of your, I guess, complex. Or yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Like, um, is that just like, well, a that's thi- because I have a baby now and she's loud. <laughs> oh, that's, oh, okay. Cause some, cause some people yeah. do do that. Some people have said to me like, oh, okay, we can do here, but they don't want to be in like a private space. Cause look, I've got the face of the enemy. I, I know what I look like. Oh no. So <laughs> you're right. I mean, it's, it is, it's, really frustrating to have to be so strict about safety but it's but it's necessary and i think it is important to say that i think it's important for people to know that like we can talk about these things i'm saying this is kind of a it comes with a territory i'm happy to have a voice in a public sphere and like i don't feel victimized (laughs) um but i need to be able to i mean i feel like letting people who are being cyber harassed know that like I'm going through it too Mm. and that I know what it feels like to scroll through my Twitter feed and like just feel sick to my stomach because you know people are saying terrible things I know what that feels like it's not um you know it's really relatable unfortunately and I think um beyond the cyber harassment what we really need to change you know policies around and this is a whole other conversation is like when it gets to be when your physical safety gets to be at risk, when people are doxxed. Um, and that is the scariest thing that's happened to me recently is like having, um, you know, people try to find out where I live and find out who my family members are, that type of thing. It, have, gets, it gets scary. And you don't pe- know who the people are. And people have done that. People have doxxed out there. They're, they have tried. Or in, the, in this recent, the, the recent thing. Oh, shit. That's okay. That's okay. What, do you do you care to share like the difference between the type of like uh, cyber harassment you had putting out the Unslut project and what happened back you know a few months ago with the uh, I want innocent dudes locked up comment? Yeah, sure. Well, there harassment related to the Unslut project and like general story sharing, educating young women about sex and feminism has been ongoing and pretty consistent because I think um, you know people see me as like a threat to what they think young women should be taught Mm -hmm. in that way. Um, But it hasn't been kind of as violent. When I say something on Twitter that's controversial, um, then the attacks are, you know, people don't even necessarily know what the Unslut Project is. And it doesn't matter. It's just that I have a woman's avatar and I've said something that upsets them on Twitter. (laughs) I mean, at that rate, it has nothing to do with my work. You existed. That was the problem. Heaven forbid. So that's honestly... (laughs) 
that's the main difference. And at that point there, I can, you know, it's frustrating because there is a line. But there is some really great conversation to be had. A really, a big problem with Twitter is that some people respond and want to ask questions or want to follow up or want to kind of dig into points you're making. And you just, when you're bombarded with just nonsense and bots, there's no way to sift through it and actually engage with the people you want to engage with or who you think you could learn from. So that's a bummer. Yeah. Well, what's what's next? Like, what what next thing are you going to piss people off with? <laughs> um, I think you mentioned I, uh, you were writing a novel earlier. Yeah, so I've just completed a psychological thriller that I'm editing now. Okay. Um, I which deals with a lot of these issues. I wrote it for NaNoWriMo, the National Novel Writing Month in um, 2017. Uh, I'm also in research and development on a new documentary, which I will tell you more about in coming months. But okay. for now, it's um, about international feminist movement. I will say. Okay. Yeah, I'm Very really cool. psyched about it. So more projects, not not letting no one keep you down. No, not, of course not. Not. Letting, <laughs> not letting people have you hiding. No. Perfect. Perfect. That's yeah. awesome. Well, Emily, where can people find um, you? Where can they find your work? Well, not literally you, because that's been a <laughs> bit of a problem. Where can they find you digitally? I should specify. <laughs> well. They can find me on social media at Emily Linden. Uh, they should definitely check out the Unslut Project. That's it's Emily just, Linden, L I N D I N, right? Yes, D I N. And uh, just definitely, if they want to share their stories, unslutproject.com um, is a great resources to check out. There are a bunch of essays there. I would love for people to, um, if they want, check out the doc as well. It's You can view it on um, Vimeo. You can view it on iTunes. And it's all linked through Unslut Project website. And also uh, pick up the pick up the book on slot. It's oh yeah, it's some powerful stuff. It's really really good. Uh, gets my personal recommendation. Thank you. And, it's yeah. called Unslut: A Diary and a Memoir. Yeah, Emily, thank you so much for uh, for finally me and up. I know that was it's fantastic. been great. Thanks, Philly. Yes, uh, why don't you say goodbye to everybody? Bye, everyone. Thanks, Philly. <laughs> oh, it's so great to finally chat with with Emily. I've been. Waiting to do that for years. Please go get her book. Uh, I, I cannot recommend it enough. It's in my in my bookcase. I have an entire shelf that's just all sex books, and Emily's book is one of my favorites on that shelf for sure. Again, the book is called Unslut: A Diary and a Memoir. You can get it on Amazon or or wherever your books are sold. You can follow her on Twitter at Emily Linden, that's L-I-N-D-I-N, and the website is unslutproject.com. Of course, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at TheBillyPresida. Give us a little shout out. Say hello. Use the hashtag ManWhorePodcast so I can find your tweets and your posts. Go like the Man Whore Podcast Facebook fan page. We're posting all sorts of fun articles for discussion and memes over there. Just search The Man Whore Podcast and you'll find it. And if you want to say something a little bit more, you want to send uh, you know your comments, your questions, your boobies, you can email me at manwhorepod at gmail.com. Finally, I am so excited to see your submissions, to see what you come up with. I want I, I cannot I hope I hope that I have a hard time selecting the winner uh, or the recipient of the Man Whore Con Scholarship Fund. And if you want to get your very own weekend pass to ManorCon, the early bird discount is still available for $75 until June 3rd when prices go up. Get your weekend pass today at manwhorepod.com slash tickets. Next week, we have, uh, we've got on a, uh, an, an old Tinder date. Who You know, I thought we hit it off. I thought, I thought that was going to work out, but sadly did not. We're going to go ahead and find out why. But until then, stay slutty.